You are listening to South Niagara Conversations, a podcast presented by the South Niagara Chambers of Commerce, along with 105.1 The River and 101.1 More FM. Here are your hosts, Dolores Fabiano and Scott Lunn. Good morning, and thanks to everyone who's joined us for our South Niagara Conversation series. Uh, for those of you who are tuning in from afar, we represent the communities of Fort Erie, Niagara Falls, Port Coburn, Waynefleet, Welland, and Pelham. We're located in Southern Ontario and the sun is always shining in our neck of the woods, or at least it is today. Scott, my co-host, my trusted uh, partner here, how are you doing this morning? Doing very well, Dolores. It's another Friday and uh, this is going to be an awesome conversation today, so I'm excited. Yeah, I am too. I am too. I also want to give a shout out to uh, our tech sponsor, Brian LaChapelle from B4 Networks. Always makes us sound so great. Brian, how are you this morning? Fantastic. Thanks, Dolores. Great. Well, this morning, we're going to be talking about uh, the state of of democracy, why citizens are or aren't engaged, and how we get people back to basics, like voting in elections. (laughs) Uh, Scott, I I feel like this has been an issue uh, that has become more and more concerning over the past few decades, really. Another interesting conversation to be had, so let's get to it. Scott, who do we have joining us this morning? Absolutely, Dolores. And if you uh, are, if you want to find out more about why voting is down and some of the uh, some of the ways other countries and areas uh, do get people out to vote, you may want to read uh, Dave Meslin's book. He's the author of Tear Down: Rebuilding Democracy from the Ground Up. And it's weird to introduce you right now because I listened to you last night. As I was drifting off to sleep and I woke up this morning and you were still talking. Uh, so uh, I don't know if that speaks volumes or not, but no, it's Strange. <laughs> very good information there. I really enjoyed it. Uh, also with us is uh, Janet Ecker, former member of the Legislative Assembly of Ontario, and Dave Augustin, former mayor of the town of Pelham, a uh, longtime mayor, 12 years, as I understand. So welcome, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. And good morning. Oh, thanks for joining us. This is going to be fun. Uh, we'll start with you, Janet. Uh, I am curious, just uh, as we look at the world today, uh, which is a very confusing time, but we're, we're focusing in on democracy, which seems to be running amok right now. But uh, in a perfect world, what should a democracy look like, uh, in a, some, if you can sum that up? Well, I think one of the unique attributes of democracy is there is no perfect uh, world uh, when it comes to democracy. It's, uh, you know, we've all heard that old saying about the sausage. No one wants to look at, you know, how messy it is to make a sausage. Uh, Democracy is very much like that. Um, It's all about brokering interests for the common good. And one of the problems I think today is that nobody wants to do the compromise. Everybody is, you know, sort of so busy driving everybody into our corners, uh, particularly in the in you know in the United States where you can really see it happening, but unfortunately, I think it's sort of tripping over into um, into uh, Canada. Um, you know, you didn't consult if you don't do exactly what I want, and so that ability to broker, to compromise, to solve problems for the greater good, um, we're losing that ability, unfortunately. Right, uh, and, and and Dave, from uh, from where you sit. Or Seth, yeah, I, you say? Oh, which which Dave? There's so Let's many. Go with, uh, we're going to go with Mayor Dave. Mayor Dave. <laughs> we'll start with the with the with the politicians, and then we'll move to okay. Uh, All right. Yeah, I I think um, there's there's kind of an interesting dynamic, and so when democracy and and you think about parliament, parliament is about speaking. It's supposed to be right. It's based on par, you know, the French word to to speak, um, and and. What I find is is that those times when um, there's uncertainty, um, those are very very difficult. Whether it's local government or provincial or federal government, um, and yet those instances are the times when we could have those conversations. Um, everybody needs to have a solution. Uh, just hearing about it again, I'm driving in on the radio today, saying, you know, with uh, Aaron O'Toole, he should be presenting his policies, his direction, etc. But really, this should be about conversation. This should be about how can we get there together? Um, and, and the idea of, and, and maybe, it's, maybe it's just the theory, I don't know. Uh, and in practice, it doesn't happen. Local government, you can try and do that a little bit more and have those conversations. 
again, the, the, the media kind of when they're writing stories and I'm not blaming them, but, and the public, if they, if they ever catch anything, a hint of uncertainty, you know, it's, it's a place to attack. Uh, and so I think there needs to be more uncertainty, more collaboration to solve those uncertain issues. And I think that'll go a long way to help uh, increase democracy in our country. All right, conversation. And, uh, and author Dave, uh, I believe on Audible, I may not quote you exactly correctly, but I believe the quote that I remember the best was, Canada's most expensive kindergarten or something to that effect. So uh, maybe you can elaborate on, on democracy from your point of view, because you certainly dug into every city and province uh, just about in, in the country. Yeah, I mean, it's it's no surprise and it's it's not a radical statement to make that question period does resemble um, a kindergarten. Uh, it's politicians themselves who are admitting this and regretting it. Um, this uh, group called Samara Center for Democracy did exit interviews of members of parliament, um, which we rarely do outside of the, the corporate world. It's a very standard idea in the corporate world that if, if um, employees leaving your firm, you sit down and say, okay, now that you're leaving, tell us what you really think so we can, we can learn from that. So Samara did that for politicians. Now that you're retiring as a politician, what do you really think? And they, a, lot, a lot of them felt embarrassed. You know, they, they went in with, with, with high hopes, with ideals. Um, they wanted to be politicians to make a difference. And they found themselves in a really polarized, hostile environment mm -hmm. that they didn't enjoy necessarily. Um, it didn't bring out the best in them or in their, in their colleagues. So I think what's really sad, though, isn't just that our democratic spaces are clearly so dysfunctional and hostile and definitely lacking the conversations that Mayor Dave described or the types of thoughtful compromises that Janet mentioned. I think what's sad is that we've all come to accept that as being normal, yeah. that grown adults yelling at each other during question period is just is just what politics is. Um, we allow politicians to behave in ways that in any other workplace would be immediate grounds for dismissal. You, you know, I'm going to age myself and I'm going to um, um, show you what a true geek I am. <laughs> so I remember uh, the year I turned either 18 or 19, not, not that long ago, ha ha ha. Um, I, I remember there was a provincial election that year and I, along with my older brother and my dad, went to the debate that was held in, in town. And I was so excited to go because it was the, the first election that I was voting in. Uh, it was hosted at Niagara College. There were hundreds of people in the room. Uh, there were a lot of family, friends and neighbors. It, it was a social event. And I remember the energy in the room, people were talking about the issues, they were talking about some of the candidates. I didn't fully understand, um, but I really wanted to. And, and I was just so excited to be there. And one of the um, candidates um, that night was Peter Cormos. And he spoke, you, you know, whether or not you agreed with his politics, like that's a whole different conversation. But he was so charismatic and and he just really spoke to that crowd. And I remember it just really um, I, it just was so engaging. And then you fast forward and, and, you know, a few years later, more than a few years later, I'm, you know, executive director for a local chamber of commerce. And now it's my job to coordinate these uh, debates. And it was like I had died and gone to heaven. And honestly, the first, so, so I've been at this gig for a long, long, long time. I started in 1990. And I would say that the first decade, yeah, the first decade, planning those debates was awesome. Uh, it was so much fun because we would get the newspaper involved and the local radio station involved and cable TV would, you know, record it and, and um, we would get hundreds of people and we would have a panel. And then when it was all done, you know, the organizers, we would go to the bar and have a drink and talk about what was said. And again, that energy. And then it just started to 
to die off. And, and I can tell you that the last election, we didn't even host um, a regular debate because what we were finding was that, first of all, people didn't come out. Secondly, um, the candidates brought their team of people and, and that was really all that, that showed up. And we just couldn't get the engagement. And it, it kind of it kind of ate away at my soul a little bit because it's more important than ever um, to, to, to hear what you know these candidates are saying and, and, and where they, they sit on various issues. But it, it seems like people just don't care anymore. Why is that? What do you guys think? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, just trying to make sure we don't have any background noise here. Yeah. Um, I think there's a couple of points. I think, uh, as I'll say, author Dave, um, he talks about, and a lot of people do, they look at question period and they think that's the be all and the end all of the whole process. Question period has always been the, the, crazy, the crazy piece of, of democracy. It always has been. Um, and you go back to earlier, uh, you know, Hansard's, uh, you know, the, the, record, the recording process for, uh, Parliament uh, or Queen's Park, and it's always been great, you know, and interjections by the honorable members, you know, was the famous uh, uh, phrase that was always in there. So it's, and I understand why that is becomes a sort of symbol, but it's not the only piece of the democratic process and it does work. And there are people who do reach across the aisle, uh, <clears throat> certainly in Canada still, um, but you're right, it's a skill that's being fast lost. So I think the question is, how do we get that back? And for example, TVO had an interesting uh, series, I don't know if they're still doing it, where they would pick people from different political parties, uh, members, and yeah. pay for them to go out and have dinner. And, and uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful thing to do, because that is part of what's happened is in the legislature, at least in Ontario, um, you know, there used to be evening sittings, and everybody deplored evening sittings, but what that meant was that everybody went out for dinner, uh, you know, sort of in between or went and had a drink in the bar or whatever. And, and so the opportunities for that kind of socialization seem to be being lost. Um, I think the second thing that, that is happening is that, and again, it's just the state of the media these days and the state of social media is that it just, it succeeds on excess, you know, so if you drive people's emotions up, if you get people riled up about something, more people pay attention to you, more people listen to your radio show, more people buy your podcast or whatever. Um, and we've just built this, this, unfortunately, this reverse virtuous circle into our whole public policy debate where the more outrageous you can be, somehow the more successful you are. And I'm not quite sure how we turn that off, but that is very much part of the problem. And the third thing, and I don't know, it's all related, I guess, but we don't give our politicians room to be people making tough choices in tough times. And as I often said, I said, government is rarely an opportunity to make uh, a decision, right and wrong decisions. It is usually a series of less wrong choices. And people just don't give politicians the room to do that anymore. And we're certainly seeing that in the current thing with, with COVID. I mean, we can all double, you know, second guess and criticize um, what uh, a politician is doing or saying or what a medical officer of health is doing or saying, but we are looking at unprecedented circumstances. We are looking at people trying to balance almost impossible, again, choices between uh, lockdown, not lockdown, all of those things. And people just don't have the tolerance or the acceptance or the human charity to say, okay, I may not agree with so-and-so, but I trust their motives. And, and I think we've lost a lot of that as well. I think, I can, oh, sorry, I can, uh, Mayor Dave. <laughs> if I can just comment, I think if, if I reflect back on uh, my experience and that is, you know, getting first elected in 2006 and, and serving on Niagara Regional Council and, and if I look at that council versus the council of 2010 and the council of 2014, that observation that, that you had, Dolores, um, and, and that is out there of it getting more, more and more and more polarized, uh, 
was was shown. Um, certainly, that that first council, um, it, you, you know, we didn't know people's party status or anything like that. We worked together. We we the, the committee meetings were not televised, uh, and it was almost like a fourth year political science class where we would kind of debate certain issues, some of the big issues, and and talk about it, and then present that to the larger group. And it and it was a conversation. It was people working together for the for the common good. Um, and then slowly it got more and more politicized. And and part of it was that people were proudly wearing their party status on their on their lapels in in local government especially at the regional level and uh and i think it's it was to the detriment um of of the debates and the discussions we had and it ended up polarizing those councils so that it and you look at the look now look, some of the councils are oh it's a it's a this group versus this group an a versus a b group etc and even at the region oh can they overcome this or can they overcome and you kind of know the players. Um, and I think, you know, if, if we could go back to that term of 2006, that kind of idea of everybody working together, but it is because of social media, it is because of parties getting involved, um, and it is because of snippets of information. I'm just going to add a few ideas here. Um, I think polarization is, is a huge part of the problem where, I mean, obviously it's more magnified in the US, um, but here, you know, it really does come down to two choices in most elections. We've only had one of two parties ever in power federally for 150 years. So it's just blue, red, blue, red, blue, red. And then aside from that blip in 1990 here in Ontario, same thing, blue, red, blue, red. And, you know, when I grew up, there was 13 channels on TV. Now there's, I don't know, infinite. You know, everyone now is surrounded by choice. We expect choice and variety. And I think for a lot of people, elections are actually just incredibly boring. This idea that there's going to be either the right's going to win or the left's going to win. When most people don't even identify with that spectrum at all. Most people are moderates in the middle. We don't even, there's no space for moderate moderation in politics anymore. I mean, I don't, I don't even know if red Toryism exists. I mean, that was a big thing when I grew up. There were there were red Tories and the word progressive and conservative actually actually meant something. And I think most people are kind of red Tories or or um, capitalist minded socialists. You know, they're all somewhere in the middle where they want that they want a good public uh, safety net. They don't mind paying taxes as long as they know that it's going towards things that benefit their family. And they want a free market to have a vibrant uh, economy. And when you polarize things where you have to choose between either I hate government or I hate big businesses, most people don't relate to either of those things. So I think the whole political landscape of, a, of it being portrayed as a, as a sport between, between blue and red is really alienating to a lot of people. And a lot of this comes down to the voting system we use, which is why I've dedicated most of my adult life to breaking down a voting system, which really limits choice. Um, I look at the, the businesses in the private sector and how there's this beautiful kind of turning over of older companies sometimes fading away because they're just not being innovative and the newer startups coming in and disrupting a sector. I would love to see that in politics. I would love to see our old dinosaur parties on the right and the left implode and break up into smaller parties. We all know that within the NDP and within the conservatives, there are people who have nothing in common politically and they're forced into these big tents. And that's what reinforces this idea of, of polarization. And one last thing I wanna to add to one big change in the last 20 years, uh, maybe 30 years has been the concentration of power in the office of the leader. So MPs and MPPs have much less of a role and a voice than they used to. So when, when Janet talks about individual MPs reaching across the aisle, I think one of the reasons that doesn't happen as much anymore is because MPs don't have any role anymore. MPPs don't have any role. The leader's office is, has so much power. And that's why people like Michael Chong with his Reform Act three years ago are trying to decentralize power within our legislatures because the more power we give to individual 
MPPs and MPs, the more ability they'll have to work across the aisle. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, as, some, as somebody who always um, liked to define herself as a red Tory, I appreciate author Dave's comments. Um, but I think, um, I think you're right. Most people are sort of somewhere in a mushy middle. Yeah. But part of the issue, and it was something that, that when, we were, when we were in government, um, we did try to introduce uh, basically a course as part of the curriculum um, on um, public affairs, on uh, civics, on, because that, like, part of the problem is that people have become less and less, um, uh, they don't know yeah. what it should and shouldn't be. So when certain things happen, well, for example, one of the great um, uh, crazy, crazy things is when a government prorogues the legislature or prorogues parliament, um, people were going ballistic that, oh my God, this was the end of democracy as we know it. Uh, you know, man, the barricades, what a, what a crisis. And I'm sitting here going, are you out of your friggin' mind, people? Like, I mean, proroguing happens at least a couple of times in every mandate of every government. It's yeah. part of the process. So I think uh, one of the things that we really need to do is to go back to make sure that, that kids in school are at least getting a grounding on what the system is, what it isn't, what the history is, why certain things are there. Um, because a lot of the practices within a, a democratic country have been built up over literally centuries, and it's not perfect. And again, the great Winston Churchill, I think it was Churchill quote about democracy is the worst form of government except every other one that's been tried. Um, there's a reason why some of those rules and processes exist, and they should be respected. And unfortunately, there's too many people who get elected and too many people who get involved who just don't have that grounding. Um, yeah. And so that's another thing that's sort of eating away at the fabric of what a good government is. The other quick thing, though, and, I, and the mayor, um, you talked about what's been happening at municipal councils. Yeah. One of the things I think, in my view, is that because there is no longer a lot of media watching municipal governments work, mm -hmm. it, 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 I mean, governments need a good media. They need yeah. good journalists to keep the eye on them, to keep the sunshine or whatever, however you want to phrase it. And there's too many municipal councils we just don't have that second, that, that, that watchdog out there. And it promotes bad behavior, bad processes. And so, I'd, again, I'm not quite sure how we fix that. But uh, that is, I think, one of the other contributions to the, the challenges yeah. of dem democracy, well, at all levels of government, but certainly at municipal. And especially in smaller towns. I mean, yeah. Toronto, yeah. Toronto City Council is being watched. Um, Welland, I'm not so sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I was I wanted to I was going to mention the, the role of the media and and Janet to your point. I, when I started uh, working in media, I was on the Dartmouth City Council beat in Nova Scotia, and then over to Halifax, which Dave brought me down History Lane in his book uh, last night. But uh, Mayor Dave, you must have seen a drastic drop off from people who covered regularly to probably maybe not at all. Well, absolutely, um, and, and and discussing those issues and covering those issues, and and yeah, there there would be again when when I started back in two thousand six, there would have been maybe the healthcare reporter would talk to you about a certain something going on in a long term care home, uh, and then uh, the economic reporter would talk to you about something else. But but now it was just sort of one reporter trying to cover all those myriad of topics uh, and, and try to understand them all. And the other was um, some of the local media, just the reporters changing so much, just fresh out of school. You know, it's almost like one had to do the civics course again for those reminder. Remember back in grade five civics when you did this, uh, this is how it works. And, and it was like a, a training, a constant sort of uh, information session for the reporter to bring them up to speed on the, on the history of the issue because the issues are, you know, they're years in length, many of them, right? Community right. centers, things like that, uh, uh, homelessness, uh, um, housing, developments, et cetera. So um, it, the, the role of the media is, is extremely important in all of that. And, and my worry is if, if maybe I can help pivot this is about what happens in COVID? What happens in this time when you can't just walk into a council meeting 
um, when you can't just pick up that that package and uh, it, whether the door is is open or closed, right? As you write about author Dave in your book, um, but but that whole idea of who's watching folks right now during you know COVID times, and and what does that do for democracy when we're in a state of emergency? And and you know oh. during this week we we received news that our local uh, papers here in Niagara are, are daily papers. Uh, they're not go going to have offices anymore. So no right. newsroom. They're all working from home permanently. I can't wrap my head around that. H how do you put out a newspaper without a newsroom where you're feeding off of each other and, and sharing contacts and leads and stories and, and just that level of, of energy? Yeah, well, it comes at, you're absolutely right. Um, I have no, I started off life as a reporter way back when, very, very, very briefly. And, and that dynamic, you're quite right, is important to the process especially for an older seasoned reporter who could sit there and, you know, sort of whop up the, you know, what the, the box, the ears of the cub reporter kind of thing, you know? Um, so, so the, the dynamic is, is twofold from COVID. You're right, Dave, that, that it's, it's undermining the ability of the media to do a job in terms of reporting, but it's also undermining the politician's ability to, to have the drink after work, to go out, sit out in the hall and have a cup of coffee and try and broker a deal, try to, you know, pick up on the signals that people yep. are trying to send, you know, in order yeah. that interpersonal piece that is so much a part of politics, business, mm -hmm. any kind of interaction. And I mean, and you're hearing it on, you know, people who are on uh, management teams, boards of directors, uh, there are problems developing that you're, you're, you're just not, you're neither not seeing them or you're not able to resolve them the way we might have normally. So, cause everything's so formal. So, you know, we're standing here looking at each other on screens. So COVID's kind of hitting us on a double whammy, both on the, the business and politics side, but also on the media side in terms of trying to cover it. Yeah, that's a great point. <clears throat> so author Dave, I'm just gonna pivot a little bit. Uh, in your book, you said that apathy, as we know it, doesn't actually exist. That people do care, but we live in a world that actively discourages engagement by constantly putting up obstacles and barriers in the way. So what are some, some examples of obstacles and, and barriers that, that are put up? I, I just found this really interesting, this whole concept. Yeah, it's a very optimistic view of what ordinary people are capable of. Um, and it also, it gives, uh, what I'm offering is empathy towards those who have tuned out because we can assume that they're tuning out because they're just that kind of cliche, you know, selfish person who just doesn't care. Or we could say, well, maybe there's, maybe there's um, elements of the way we've designed our political landscape that are giving people good reason to turn away. In which case, by shifting the blame, we actually open the door to um, remedies and to fixing things because as long as we believe that everyone you know doesn't care and there's and they, you know they're so stupid and selfish like how do you fix that but if we actually shift the blame and say maybe the system itself is pushing people away it's a much more optimistic view because you can you can you can fix a broken system um, so the big categories would be you know things we hear all the time around campaign finance reform around changing our voting system. We're an extreme outlier uh, in the modern Western world with, with our voting system. Um, but I also talk in the book about how there's a lot of small details. My, my, my first chapter is called The Mechanics of Exclusion. And it's about how the littlest details can, can add up. Um, and the analogy I use is how, you know, some of the largest and most expensive sewage systems in our municipalities if you look at what's clogging them, it's, it's little pieces of dental floss and, you know, baby wipes <laughs> um, blocking these, you know, massive turbines and, 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 and pumps. So what, what I do is I, I go into political space and I look around at the small, subtle cues that might make someone feel welcome versus alienated. And then what I do in the book, too, is I compare that to, pr to private commercial spaces where all those elements are the exact opposite. So if I walk into any store or restaurant or commercial establishment, we could do that right now. And I could point out to you 20 things 
that the owner has intentionally done to make me feel comfortable from the color of the walls to whatever music is playing to the door either being unlocked or, or usually wide open, maybe a sign saying welcome. I love how Tim Hortons after the drive through says, see you tomorrow. Like they, they put so much money and thought into what we call the user experience. They want you to, they want you to notice, notice them, come through the door and then enjoy it so much that you'll come back with a friend, right? And you go into a city hall and it's almost as if someone made a list of the 50 things we could do to make someone want to come in and stay and then done the opposite, like flip that list upside down or, you know, put the word don't in front of each one. And, you know, one of the simplest ones to use as an example is, is food. So if any of you invited me over uh, to, to your home for a meeting or a discussion, the first thing you would say is, can I get you a drink? Do you want a snack? Or you'd already have some chips and carrots out or whatever. And in our, in our um, municipal meetings in particular, um, definitely provincial and federal, not only are you not allowed to bring in, to, not only are they not serving food, you're not allowed to eat in the chamber. So many of our municipal council chambers literally have signs up saying no food or drink allowed. And um, I don't know, it's just these, the contrast between spaces where you know someone's put effort into making you feel welcome compared to any of our political, the, the Queens Park, um, even more since you were there, Janet, but the, the, the rules there for the public are so, are so prehistoric. I remember having a pencil, I, I, I write in the book how, I understand why you can't bring a knife in, uh, but they'll, they'll take away an, an, you know, any electronic device, even though you might be using it to actually read the agenda um, or to research something or, or God forbid tweet about the meeting. Uh, but they even took away my pencil. I wasn't allowed to bring a pencil into the, into the legislature um, because you're, you're, you're actually not allowed to, as a member of the public, you're not allowed to write when you're, when you're, sitting there as a guest. Anyways, I could go on and on about all the small details, but um, the, the, um, the, the problem is, is that we're not taking a step back and putting effort into looking at political spaces through the lens of user experience, because the lobbyists are always going to show up. It's their job. The political geeks like me, we're going to show up no matter what. Like the activists are always going to show up. They'll, they'll figure it out whether the door is open or closed. We're going to find our way in. What we're missing, and the journalists will find their way in, the people we're missing is my mom and my sister, just like ordinary people. And those are the voices we need. Forget about the activists and, you know, the nonprofit leaders. What about ordinary people? And the reason they're not there is because no one's welcoming them in. And because through bureaucratic jargon and, you know, alienating language, the polarization and Janet, you're right. Question period is the darkest part of the process, but it's the part we see. Mm -hmm. If you actually say, I, I want to get involved with politics, I'm going to go and watch. That's what you see. That's the, that's that part you end up watching. So it is important how these, how these things look. And I don't blame people for being turned away. I don't blame people for rolling their eyes and saying, I don't even know if I want to vote anymore. So, well, the, so the, the answer is to fix the system. Yeah, no, no. And that's a really, really insightful comment. Um, and let me push back just a bit, though. One, yeah. a lot of the processes and procedures that are now in council chambers, uh, parliament, uh, Queen's Park and whatever, are because of legitimate security issues that they've had, unfortunately, sure. right? So sure. it's spoiled it for everybody. So, I mean, you're right. I mean, I, I, I mean, as a former MPP, I don't have to necessarily go through all the processes that the public goes through, but I have on occasion done that. And it's like, oh my God. So <laughs> you're absolutely right. That is a, a problem. And, and I'm not quite sure how we get the balance right between security uh, and those people who come into the chamber to deliberately disrupt things. I mean, we've yeah. seen this happen at all, you know. Um, so that that's one piece. But on the reaching out to, I mean, there are more um, telephone town halls with elected officials, more MPs, MPPs, councillors that have got everybody practically in their constituency's email. Um, you know, they send them stuff. The person can send things back. So in some ways, 
there was much more accessibility yeah. um, and transparency in some cases um, than we've ever had before. Um, and yet, I mean, because I can remember, gee, you know, the big deal was putting out your your newsletter four times a year to your constituents, my God, in the mail and all that, you know, I mean, how incredibly quaint. Um, where now you've just got so many tools to communicate out and the public, Mr. and Mrs. Front Porch, have so many ways to contact um, politicians now than they, they never used to have. Yep. So after I, I uh, read your book, Author Dave, I, I started to be a, a little more mindful. And um, you're right on the money. Holy smokes. Um, I would go to, you know, a, a council meeting and uh, a, a big meeting. Uh, I mean, certainly, you know, uh, City Hall was aware that there was going to be a good turnout, big turnout, not nearly enough chairs. So people standing, not even in, in council chambers, in the hallways, like just not comfortable, not welcoming. Um, and, and, and lots of those examples, uh, it, just never, it just never clicked before I read your book. Yeah. Um, and and in I just wonder, in, in today's, in today's um, uh, environment, can we... Can we start u utilizing digital platforms to, to try and engage people a little more with, with government? But they are. I mean, Dolores, there has never been so much of that kind of thing going on. And I'm not saying it's the magic solution, but mm -hmm. it's to, we are, you know, politicians are doing that. Governments are doing that. I mean, the budget consultation process, um, first of all, there never really used to be one. Then it was just uh, uh, the finance, you know, when I was finance minister, I mean, you used to meet with the heads of, you know, uh, major, you know, the Chamber of Commerce or, you know, the major uh, lobby groups, if you will, or advocacy groups, you would meet with them. Uh, then it kind of started to do um, uh, a traveling roadshow where you went out and actually had people coming into like town halls, informal town halls. And now they do online budget consultation where sort of anybody who wants to can access the process through sending in, you know, information um, and what they think, you know, should happen in a budget and finance does actually, at least certainly in my day, um, track that. I mean, you would get briefed on, it would be reams of charts and graphs saying, okay, this person or this group or whatever, you know, in Sault Ste. Marie. Um, so you, you, actually that was, Listen to now, but it was acted on appropriately, depended on your point of view or your political stripe. But certainly that process is much more open, I, I would argue, than ever before. So it doesn't mean Dave's wrong, but it's not the solution to what's going on out there or not going on out there. Yeah, I, th I think I think digital tools can be really helppful, but I, I don't, they... Um... In other ways, digital platforms actually really amplify polarization. I mean, we all know that like the worst discussions in the world are unfolding on Twitter, not not in living rooms. Um, so I'm I'm actually a big proponent of still having actual people in a room responding to each other's body language and laughter and nods. Even you're all nodding right now, right? Like if, if we were just doing this through some kind of you know, text-based app. So I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of creating um, comfortable physical um, spaces where yeah. people can gather and have meaningful, thoughtful discussions. And I mean, we're really just scratching the surface here. I think one thing that, that is turning so many people off of politics still is that it's still so male dominated. And I can't believe I have to say this in 2021. I'm Janet, I believe was the first woman to introduce a budget in the legislature. Like we were breaking glass ceilings, um, you know, a little while ago. And in some ways it's kind of plateaued and in some ways we're actually losing ground municipally, especially it's normal for a city council to be 80% men. Um, Pickering has an entire male council. Every member of the Pickering council is male. Every premier right now in Canada is male, which is statistically, I mean, if you if if you consider one one premier of any one random province of being male or female, be a fifty percent chance. You extrapolate that over ten provinces, and it's like the probability of that happening on its own would be, I think, one in ten trillion. Yet 
it's normal. And again, data clearly shows that the type of voting system you use has a huge impact on gender representation. So what I'm all I'm arguing for, it's funny because some people see me as, you know, a, a radical or someone who's proposing all these crazy reforms. All I'm saying is let's do the same thing in politics that we do everywhere else. Find me a company, find me a family, find me a person who isn't always looking to improve themselves, to innovate, to find the newest trend of how to do something new. And in politics, it's all about this is the sacred way. You know, imagine a corporate boardroom saying, well, we're going to just run this company the way we did 100 years ago because that's what my grandfather did. That, you know, that's how we design our legislatures. It's based on an almost religious connection to the past that nothing should change. The decorations sh shouldn't change. The wood paneling shouldn't change. We're still going to call the mayor your worship and someone's going to walk into the chamber with a, a mace and, you know, you know, lay it down. What are we doing? Imagine a CEO walking into a boardroom and laying down a mace. We're, we're Some boardrooms could wearing, use that weapon. Some wearing a chain. Wearing a, a, imagine if every board, a chair, chair of a board had to wear a stupid chain around their neck for the board photo. So we need to get rid of this prehistoric notion that politics is, that the, that the procedures of politics are static. We need to, we need to have an entrepreneurial startup capitalist spirit within political spaces that allows for new ideas to grow. There's a, there's a difference between um, process though and symbols. And I, that's where I would argue back. I mean, to me, the mace, and again, just to pick a, a silly point, if you will, sure. right? Um, the processes, you're quite right. I think that, that there needs to be a, a strong look at some of those processes, but yeah. throwing out the symbols is could be part of the problem because that symbol, that means something, right? That is supposed to mean something. It is supposed to be symbolic and as a, a number of those things are. So I think, again, it's just a bit of, more of a nuanced approach to how, because sure, I think sure. you're right, absolutely right. How can we improve ourselves? And by the way, they did change some of the, re the decorations in the legislature. I don't know, but how, well, and they're completely uh, revamping the, the uh, parliament buildings up there. So there you go. You're getting some change. You don't think they're going to rebuild it as a perfect replica of how it looked before? Probably. <laughs> um, so as, as one of the mayors in the Niagara Peninsula that never had a chain of office, and I'm proud of that uh, because just our community never did, uh, and Thorold is the, is the other one, um, I, I think there's some really interesting points here. The, the first is that, um, you know, I've been there when there's people waiting to come into the, in, into the council chamber and there's not enough chairs and I would get out of my seat and go, you know, and then I drag staff and we bring in more chairs, et cetera. Right. Just to, to make it more comfortable. Um, but, but how do you do that now in the middle of, in the middle of COVID yeah. um, and some of the discussions that we had at uh, some of our public meetings, for instance, is that, okay, we're going to hold it at seven o'clock on a, on a Tuesday or heaven forbid at 10 AM on a Tuesday yeah. Um, how, how do we get people that, that are working, that have kids, that have families, that are whatever, that are trying to represent the real community to do that? And so some ways, can you do the, that electronically, yeah. on, on, online, it's... et cetera? Um, but I think a, a real issue is that sometimes uh, governments, councils, well, let go out and say to the community, we're, we're consulting, we're consulting on the budget, we're consulting on this, we're consulting on this. But the big question is, what aren't you consulting on? And shouldn't it be open that somebody can come in and talk about an issue? One of the things that I drive by his house every day, what breaks my heart is I remember a gentleman coming in and standing up in the middle of a council meeting and say, I want to talk about this. And I would have to say, bang the gavel and say, I'm sorry. It's almost like this tone policing that we're, that we're doing. I'm sorry, sir. Now's not the time. You can't. Well, why can't I raise this issue? And then I talked to him afterwards. He wants to talk about speeding and he came to the council meeting just wanting to talk about a certain issue in front of his home. Right. And we couldn't put him on the agenda because we never had that allowance, right? Right, but so, you could create that allowance. And, and yeah, I've been exactly. to council yeah. meetings. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Montreal's borough councils have this thing called question period. And it's not question period between the members. It's before the meeting, it's called question period. And it's for any member of the public to ask a question. Right. And I've seen it. I've seen it work. It's a be it's it's a beautiful thing. 
And, um, and, yeah. and it also, it, it also implies that you're coming to the meeting ahead of time and, and all that. Right. So yeah. there have to be other opportunities to do that. So some counselors sure. are going out and having ward meetings. Some mayors are using Instagram to talk about various issues and respond yeah. back to the community. I wrote a column every week or every other week to try to just explain things that are going on and answer questions on emails that I got, et cetera. Um, but it, you know, it, does it go back to the voting system? I don't know. I mean, if there's no change in the voting system and the, the government on high, the, the provincial government says you're just a creature of the province. So you do what we say and they get rid of ranked ballots. Um, you know, how can we have that discussion? We have to stay, stick within the system that we're in. Can we change the system? Let's try. What, what a great segue to something I really wanted to touch on quickly, which is, which is voting reform. Um, and again, this is, this is just essentially adopting the same type of approach we take to everything else in society. So, you know, we upgrade the operating systems on our phone every month, it seems, and we haven't upgraded the operating system of our democracy in 150 years. Um, ranked ballots is such a simple change. All of our parties use it, conservative, liberal, NDP, green, no party leader is elected in Canada. Um, without using a runoff system where you need 50% of the vote to win. If you're a mayor or a councillor and 70% of your constituents don't want you back, you should not be able to win your seat. Yet that happens every four years in Ontario all across the province. And I thought it was great when the previous government brought in the ranked ballot legislation because it didn't force any city to switch. All it said is if you want to try the system that our party's already using, um, Kathleen Wynne became, you know, leader of our party using a ranked ballot. And by the way, she wasn't winning on the first round, uh, but she won because of the ranked ballot, um, or in their case, multi-round runoff. If cities want to use it, go ahead. Who, who are we to tell cities what system they should use? And London, Ontario used a ranked ballot. I really want to encourage everyone to read the report that we've written on this. It's called London Leads. Um, you can get it from londonleads.ca. Um, we did extensive research into it. And it was so appalling that the Ford government, again, Doug Ford was elected with a ranked ballot. Um, absolutely hilarious that a conservative government, who are all, they're supposed to be against big government telling everyone what to do, that they banned anyone from using a ranked ballot <laughs> in Ontario. Um, it's like, it's, um, it's a granny state stepping on everyone's toes, micromanaging people's local affairs, which is the exact opposite of what conservative parties are supposed to be about. So London's being forced to switch back by Doug Ford. Um, referendums were scheduled in Meaford and Barrie, they've all been canceled, but it doesn't really matter. It's coming back. Ranked ballots will be back in Ontario, whether it's one year, or f five years, and they'll be coming to all the other provinces as well. What I'm trying to do is build a nationwide movement for voting reform with people from all parties. And I'm working with liberals, conservatives, new Democrats. We've got Guy Giorno, who is a former chief of staff to Mike Harris and Stephen Harper. We've got Hugh Siegel. And of course, we've had prominent leaders from liberals, NDP and Greens. And all we're saying is, let's take a look at the system. We know it's failing us on so many counts, whether it's lack of choice, um, false majorities, wrong winners, hyperpolarization, lack of women in office. Why don't we explore the other systems that almost every other Western country in the world is already using and all of our political parties? Well, does anyone want to respond to that? I guess the one, um, it's interesting that a number of provinces have actually held referendums on changing, the, as they call it, the first past the post system, which is what we have now. Yeah. And they've been defeated. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so people have not voted for it. And I, you know, I'm not disagreeing with Dave's point about let's, let's explore it, let's look at it. But again, um, we've also seen countries that have, whether it's ranked ballots or whether they have proportional uh, representation or whatever, and those systems have just as many problems as ours does. Um, they may be different problems, but, you know, like, for example, I mean, look at look at Israel right now. I mean, Israel waiting is, for Israel. Yeah, I, was, I, I mean, thought you were going to mention Italy or Israel. I wasn't sure which one would come. Well, that's right. But I mean, I, I think Israel is even, 
even worse in some ways uh, because that has been a, a functioning country, if I could put it that way. And with all due respect, I'm going like, to I'm going to I'm going to rudely interrupt. So I have a page in my book about how every time I mention PR, someone mentions Israel, and I have a page all about Israel. So using Israel is an argument that comes up, and it's just totally ridiculous because every mainland European country uses PR. So yes, Israel that. Israel is a bit of a of a but what it does, though, David, what it does and, and again, it's not the be all and the end all either, because when I vote for a, a party or a politician, I, you know, I vote for somebody from from the purple party and that person gets elected. But then they sit down and they make a deal with the green and the red and the blue parties to get into power. And they end up doing something that is nowhere near what I thought I was voting for. So your accountability gets really screwed up in a PR system. Um, and so to me, I mean, I'm not saying we should never do PR, but I'm just saying we've got to be very clear what the downside is of a PR system as well. So, so and to, yeah. Yeah, f- fair enough. So l- l- let, let me be devil's advocate quickly and say that what you, were, what you were advocating for 40 minutes ago was that you want to see more people crossing the aisle and negotiating and compromising. Yes, yes. It's not a bad thing. So um, New Zealand but is a great example. It's not necessarily what's preventing that. It would be my argument. But anyway, it's, it's a big part of it. So the most polarized countries right now are countries like the UK and the US and Canada. They're using first past the post. And if you look at sure, you could choose Italy and Israel, which are probably the two most invaded countries in the history of our species and have have a history that prevents them from ever having a stable democracy. But Proportional systems are used everywhere from Norway to Sweden to New Zealand to Australia to, uh, you know, you, you name a European country, they're using PR. And what you find is parties working together, way more female leadership. Uh, leadership. Um, I think it's Finland right now that has a coalition of five parties. All five leaders are women, um, intergenerational all working together. But the best example is New Zealand, where the Labour Party was forced to work with the Greens two elections ago. And then more recently, Labour won an outright majority. They actually got more than 50% of the actual vote, which I don't know if that's ever happened in Canada. I think Mulroney did it. And um, they, they won a majority of the seats and they formed a coalition with the Greens anyways, because they just, these two female leaders actually wanted to work together. You know, imagine that happening in Canada. Imagine Doug Ford winning a majority um, or Andrea Horvath or whoever and saying, we're going to offer a few cabinet posts to the other party because we're all better off if we work together. So there is tons of evidence showing that experimenting with other systems has benefits. And, and you know, Janet's right. We've had provincial referendums and they failed, although 58% voted yes in BC in 05 but they had set the threshold at 60 to win. But Janet, that's why I've been promoting the idea that we should start local. Yeah. I think, you know, cities should be the kind of democratic laboratories. You know, we're, we're experimenting with online voting in, in, in cities all across Ontario, way before Queen's Park is going to even look at it, let alone Ottawa. So forget about voting reform if for Queen's Park or the House of Commons. Why don't we have legislation that allows cities to experiment with things like ranked ballots locally. And that's the legislation we won. And that's the legislation that Doug Ford ripped away from us. I was trying to explain to my son, because he was asking questions about why don't we do proportional representation in Ontario? Why don't we do it? And, and I, well, there was a referendum yeah. and how did it go? And, you know, I think it was a weird thing because it was like an all or nothing you either don't like proportional representation uh, or you don't particular, you like it and you don't particularly like this particular form of proportional representation. It was almost like a people. So, you know, I wanted proportional representation, but I didn't agree with the form. So I'm voting against along with everybody else that didn't like proportional representation. There, there, so, there, there was a third category. There was a third category, Dave, which I think was the biggest one, which is most people had no idea there was a referendum happening well, and definitely, not, but, <laughs> yes, but definitely I, didn't I, understand either of the options. And I think I Dalton McGinty say, did that on purpose. Yeah. Give us a chance to investigate proportional yeah. representation. Yeah. Okay, great. Now, now go and we'll, we'll come up with a system and, and then we'll retune it in 10 years or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I, I think the, 
the local one is a scary one. Our council looked at it and, and we said, that's kind of scary um, because we don't know a lot about it. The, the London Leeds report wasn't out, et cetera, right? Yeah. And, and some, some municipalities went and, and, and took it and said that they wanted to do it. And, and I'm glad London did. Uh, I guess London oh. could say to the province, they could say, we're just doing it anyways. And what's the province going to do? Try and stop it? <laughs> they they might. Help, right? Because can the, can the local municipality uh, take about the not, notwithstanding clause like uh, <laughs> you know, the provincial government did with, with voting and, and the Toronto election? Yeah. Um, so, you know, how do we get closer and talk about these things and, and, and try to embed them? Uh, the Welland City Council is currently saying they are going to appoint a person uh, to fill a vacancy and they're not going to take the next person in line. They're not going to have a by-election. They're going to invite people to come and make an application in a closed session. They're not going to say who those people are and they're going to decide in a closed session. To, uh, why can't Welland City Council either call a by-election, which will help yeah. clear things, or you say, we are only accepting applications from women. We are only accepting applications from people of color. And, and we're going to tell you who they are and we're going to have an open session. You know, so there's, there's a lot of creativity that can come even with the systems that we have. Yeah. And uh, so I, I just love, Dave, that you're, you're encouraging us to do this and, and, and to think about it more. And sometimes these things take a lot of time to evolve. And they hopefully do. we're getting closer to some resolution. We are. And, and let me just add one more quick thing. There were two referendums in 2018. The most recent referendums we've had on voting reform in Canada was in Kingston, Ontario, and Cambridge, Ontario. They both held, they spent money to hold referendums on you switching to ranked ballots. And in both cities, the, the residents voted yes. We want to switch to ranked ballots. And Doug Ford's government has canceled the outcomes of both of those referendums, some, somehow for the people, even though the people had actually spoken. Well, I think it's a, I think it's a larger conversation too, because it was not a, it was there were a lot of people pushing the Ford government uh, uh, against uh, it as well, and you might want to argue that you know they made the wrong decision, and I'm not close enough to to uh, the government to uh, to argue on both sides. But I do know there was not a consensus that they should go that way. However, yeah. I do agree, Dave, that there needs to be a conversation about this because municipal governance is closest to the people. In many ways, it's the most important level of government. And we need to, it, that's not a bad place to start uh, in terms of what might work in London, what might work in Kingston, because um, there yeah. are there is a lot to offer in terms of looking at a different process. Um, uh, and see what we can do because it is a different era. It is yeah. a different era, yeah, but I think we've sure. got to be careful about babies and bathwater too. Um, yeah, and for see sure. What we can do to make that, and just you know, like in I, there were some things that I was able to do across the aisles. I'm very, very proud of it, uh, and there are some politicians who still do that. Uh, thank God. All, all hope is not lost. Uh, oh, that's right. Janet Eckert, uh, Dave Augustine. Uh, and Dave Meslin, thanks so much. You know, I wish there were still press bars because we could just go over that. Oh, that's the problem. <laughs> Bring back the press bar. There was one in London when I was there, but I think that's gone down too. Uh, thanks. You guys were, were awesome. We can carry this on forever. Thank you all so very much. Uh, and Dolores, we'll hang with you. Good luck, Dave. Thanks. Thank thanks, you, everyone. Panel. Great Let's talk, Dave. <laughs> uh, next week, we'll be talking to some of our frontline workers here in Niagara to hear their perspective about being in healthcare during the pandemic this past year. Our guests will include Dr. Kareem Ali, Director, Division of Infectious Disease and Antimicrobial Stewardship Program and Pandemic Preparedness. I believe he uh, treated the first COVID case here in Niagara. We'll also have joining us Natalie Ferrero, RN, Kidney care clinic manager, hemodialysis unit, and she's currently moonlighting on the uh, NH uh, vaccine clinic, and Leslie LeDuc, program and services manager at the extended care unit in Welland. It'll be another great conversation. To all of our listeners, send us the topics that you're talking about because we want to talk about them too. Thanks again for tuning in and have yourselves a wonderful day. Thanks very much. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Hi, everyone. Bye. Be safe.